took this photograph a few years ago. I was sitting in the back seat of a helicopter that had no doors. I was flying over a ridge top uh, in Wyoming, and those are elk in the distance. And that guy sitting in the front seat has a net gun in his hands, and he's about to shoot that net at one of those elk. And then the, the elk will fall over. And without even having the helicopter land, he unclips one carabiner and jumps out of the helicopter. And he wrestles that elk to the ground. And then he's joined by his teammates. And they do this whole rigmarole um, to tag, put a, a radio tracking collar. Um, and through this kind of activity, ecologists like me um, better understand the way the world works. It's not all fun. Um, my friend Arthur, who's on the right there, has his hand up the north end of the south facing elk there getting a fecal sample. This is really exciting stuff though overall, fecal samples aside. But it's not what I do. I study frogs. This is a couple of my graduate students taking a break from a garden party. And they're able to study their uh, study organisms right around the places that we live. So why would I study frogs when I could be flying around in helicopters chasing elk or working on whales or something really magnificent like that? There's a lot of answers to that. Like anybody, I'm a complicated person. But the biggest reason is because frogs are everywhere. They live on, in that landscape in Wyoming. They live in garden parties in Connecticut. They live outside the door of this building. They live all around us. They occupy the environments that in many ways are most important to our own welfare. And so we can use them to understand how our world works. And by better understanding their biological fate, we can learn something about our own. So let's get into the sex. On the left-hand side here, you have uh, tissue. This is sectioned and stained. Uh, gonad tissue from a uh, female frog, so that's ovary tissue. And those kind of hexagonal blobs are all developing eggs. On the right, that's male gonadal tissue from a testis. And all those little peppercorn things are developing sperm cells. So this is what things look like when they're not quite right. On this slide here, there are egg-like cells, we call them oocytes, inside of what uh, from the outside of this animal appear to be a male, and most of that tissue looks like testicular tissue. And those are eggs that are developing inside of male gonadal tissue. That's not normal. We've been studying this for the last several years, trying to understand how this happens, where it happens, and what it means. To better understand that, I've got to do a little detour into the world of, of fish. So, Starting about 25 years ago, people discovered that this same thing that I just showed you in, in frogs was going on in uh, fish, freshwater and estuarine fish, all over the world. The pattern is usually like this. I'm only going to show a few data slides today. This is, these are data from the Grand River in uh, Ontario, Canada, um, and they're rainbow darters. Um, and on the x-axis, that's upstream on the left to downstream on the right in kilometers along the river. And on the y-axis, that's the number of those oocytes, those, those little egg cells growing inside of male gonadal tissue in these, these darters. And you can see there in the middle, right after the river, it's that little red bar. Something happens. And then you can see it decays after that. Patterns like this have been found all over the world. And what's going on at that little red bar is there's a sewage treatment outflow. So there's treated, not untreated, treated sewage getting into the river. And then there's a problem with these fish. So you don't have to be too smart to figure out there's something going on that's associated with that, that sewage treatment outflow. These patterns helped us understand that even treated wastewater has chemicals in it that are causing 
endocrine problems, problems with the way hormones are used in the bodies of these fish. Um, and we need to better understand that. So we now know, because the chemistry has gotten much better, that the medicines we use, um, the this, this substances that are in plastics, um, some kinds of soap, fire retardants, many of these chemicals are very much like uh, hormones that are in our bodies. They mimic those hormones. And when they're released into the water, in this case for these fish, they can cause problems. They can cause abnormal sexual development in these animals. Another way we know this, so that's, that's just observations. We go out and we look at the fish and we see that there's a problem. But in Boulder, Colorado, and this is an area of the, the septic uh, treatment works in, in Boulder, um, they did what amounts to an experiment. They had these kind of problems going on in uh, suckers. That's a, a picture of a sucker up there. And in that Boulder Creek that runs along there, and that's where the, um, the sewage treatment outflow dumps into. So they knew they had this problem, and they decided to do something about it. So about 10 years ago, this plant was upgraded. Instead of using the technology that had been there for decades, they put in a new technology that can remove organic compounds like the ones that uh, the bodies of these fish interpret as their own hormones. And the problems went away. So we've got very good evidence that this is going on in rivers and estuaries all over the place. But remember about the frogs. Frogs live where we live. So what we wanted to do is figure out, is this going on around where, where we are, uh, in, in and around the neighborhoods that we live in? So we studied a species called the green frog. It's the most common species that's found in developed neighborhoods. Um, it, it lives in cities, it lives in suburbs, and it also lives out far away from people. There's 24 different populations of green frogs living in different ponds represented up there. And on the x-axis, that's going from the fraction of a, a zone around that pond that it is forested. Um, the left-hand side, of the fraction is zero. And the right-hand side is 100%. And on the y-axis, that's the portion of the, the males that we pulled out that showed intersex. And you can see that line has a downhill slope. What that means is the more the world around one of these ponds it has forest cover around it, which is, this is, this is, these are data are from Connecticut. So that's the native uh, vegetation cover around here. The less likely you are to have problems with the, the development of these animals. Okay, not surprising. You get away from all kinds of stuff and um, you get back into as close as Connecticut has to pristine environments and you have fewer problems. This is the one that's more worrisome. Same axis, except this time, it's the proportion of the environment that's suburban neighborhoods. And on the y-axis, it's the proportion of the animals we found in each of these couple dozen ponds that showed intersex. And you can see that line is heading uphill. In other words, the more of the environment around these places that's suburban, the more intersex we see. And we've done this a couple times in different, different places, and we get the same result over and over again. This is a very strong result. So we know that this is happening. Now we've got to figure out what we, what we do about this. Um, so the frogs are vertebrates, like us. Genetically, we're more similar than you'd care to admit. And we have a lot of the same physiological pathways. The hormones that they use have analogs that run around in our own bodies. And they're living right next to us. And they're absorbing what we're growing at them. So in, in other realms, our society, I think, has done a pretty good job of seeing issues and taking them on. So up here on this, this slide, there's, there's two cars represented. On the left-hand side, that's the first Prius that came to the United States in 2000. And um, its success now in its fourth or fifth generation is, is in part because people recognize that we need to do something about fossil fuels. Car makers saw that. They provided an alternative. People have the ability to make choices. 
And you know, less than 20 years later, we have even new car companies like Tesla making brand new cars. And it's very easy to see where we're headed. There's a trajectory there. That's progress. So here's a couple of pictures of septic systems. So home septic system is basically a Victorian invention. In the 1860s in France and then in the 1880s in the United States, people figure out we got to do something about the wastewater. And they developed this technology. The figure on the right is uh, a modern septic system. There aren't enough differences to even matter. The technology that we use today when we have residential septic treatment is basically Victorian technology. We're not dealing with this in an important way. We, we need to change how we think about this. We need a Prius or a Tesla septic system. And this is not a new recognition. So this is a quote by Aldo Leopold, who graduated from the school where I teach, uh, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale. And he says, let's build a better motor and tap the uttermost powers of the human brain. To build a better countryside, we throw dice. He wrote that in 1933. You could write that today. This can't stay like this. And it isn't because people haven't been thinking about it. These are just images of a few different companies' takes on what a next generation home septic system is. But you, you, if you want to go out and build a house, the municipality where you live might not even let you use one of these. The regulation which has promoted innovation in other spheres, like in the automotive industry, stands in the way of making changes, even when they can improve things, in this realm. And the other thing is that who wants to think about this stuff? I think about it way more than I have to because of my research. But it's, it's, it's a lot harder to get people excited about this than it is to get them excited about a Tesla or something. But we have to think about this. And, and you can start to see glimmers of this. Because it's not just septic tanks and whatever. It's food packaging, soaps, fire retardants, house siding, shingles, all kinds of things. Uh, people have done really innovative work showing, um, you know, when you put a brand new boat in water, there's a halo of dozens of chemicals that start leaching into the water. And when we put thousands of boats into a lake like Lake Tahoe, that becomes important. It matters. And nobody has ever really thought about this before. Not in this way. So we're at the beginning of this recognition that there's going to be a different way to live with chemicals in the environment. And we, we all of us, have to be serious about making sure that the people that can make the changes know that they should and the people who, who regulate these industries, the elected officials, everybody knows not to get in the way of this stuff. Because we will eventually figure out that what is going on with the frogs has analogs in all of us. Thank you.